great to have you here in Australia. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. Sorry about the weird handshake. I have a That's all right. messed up shoulder. So, you sure that wasn't from uh, playing guitar too long last night? I think that the guitar had a little something to do with that. Yeah. Yes. That was great to have you with the Sonic Pie Band. That was. Uh, oh, it was so much fun. I wanted to to play with a DJ for a long time. So, being able to do it and have him coding at the whole time, the. The fun thing was to notice there were a group of people who were out dancing, uh, and then there were a group of the really geeky geeks who were standing off to the sides, absolutely still trying to figure out how Sam was coding that. Like, how does, how does that code relate to the sounds I'm hearing? But it's really the code is the important thing here in the midst of all this chaos. That was so much fun to watch. Uh, it's great to have you out speaking again after many years working at Facebook. and doing it. Uh, maybe you'd like to just share your, what you're talking about with 3x and explore, expand, extract with us. <laughs> Where you think you're going in terms of now that you're out of the big company and looking to, I think, maybe take on the mission of trying to uh, move people back towards what uh, kind of XP was all about and building software is about, but addressing it for large numbers. Sure. The, so the fundamental puzzle that struck me when I joined Facebook almost eight years ago now was how do they simultaneously give hundreds of millions of people a, a good experience at this unprecedented scale, grow their users at, at a rapid clip, and innovate at the same time? I'd never seen an organization that was able to do all three. When I got there, it just looked like complete chaos. So I had to reset my understanding of software engineering because they weren't doing the things in my books, but they were being very successful. And there's nothing more annoying to an author than, than people not following your advice and being successful. I don't mind if people don't follow my advice. I just want them to fail. So um, by watching carefully, participating in software development, and doing a lot of mentoring of younger engineers, I was able to see that there were three distinct styles of project at Facebook. There were these exploration projects where there was very little to lose and things were set up so that they could, uh, the, this kind of experimentation could happen. And that style requires a, 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 a engineering discipline. You can cut corners because you're not going to live with this stuff very long. Um, it's small scale on purpose. You don't worry about scaling. Uh, and it's, uh, the projects are very short. Well, then something would take off and everything would change. Everybody would get together in, in one room and the technical experts necessary to, to overcome the technical hurdles of scaling would be drawn from all over the company to make sure that this feature, now Photos is blowing up and we're running out of photo space. Okay, so everybody's gonna concentrate on that intense scaling period, and that's a different discipline, engineering discipline, management discipline, different financial discipline, than the discipline of exploration. It's not better or worse, it's just different. The, the trade-offs have shifted. And then at some point, growth continues, but it becomes predictable. And predictable growth is its own engineering, financial, management, discipline, requiring oftentimes different people, different technologies, a different time frame that you're looking towards. And the remarkable thing from my perspective was that Facebook would run these projects in different styles inside the same organization with the same people sometimes moving between projects as somebody would start something out. They'd, grow, they'd go through that crazy growth phase and then they'd peel off and start out something else. So this question, how much do I have to lose, escaped me throughout uh, the development of extreme programming. I just thought, OK, here's the set of rules for software development. Not rules, rules that you have to follow, but the direction you go. Well, if you're exploring, the trade-offs are completely different than you're in this extraction phase. So uh, that was a big wake-up call to me. Uh, uh, humility about, you know, do you write tests? Do you estimate? Do you have deadlines? Oh, it all depends. Um, so that, that was the big lesson. In the 10 months since uh, I got fired, 
I started looking at, started talking about this 3X because it's really fundamentally changed the way I look at software development <coughs> and my business development and life in general. And I've gotten a hugely positive response. People saying I applied it, just snapped a bunch of my problems into focus, I knew what to do next. But an even stronger reaction was, we like this 3X stuff, it's really helpful, but we've been trying an agile transformation for the last 10 <laughs> years. And you know we, we knew about extreme programming, but it sounded like a lot of work. So we'd been doing stand-ups, and then a whole bunch of other stuff on top of that, and it's just not working. Could you tell us about that extreme programming stuff again? And I'm on, I like new stuff. So it was a little bit of a come down for people to want to hear like my greatest hits. You know, I'm giving, I'm going on rants about using scope control for project management that I haven't given in 15 years. But if that's the message that people are interested in, there's a demand for the hard work of, prop, of proper software engineering. Coupled with this, there's this 3x question that, that profoundly influenced what proper means, that sets the context for that. At the same time, I've connected, reconnected with the community of extreme programmers who kind of went underground when the brand went out of fashion and have been quietly practicing, oftentimes very successfully, for the past 15 years. So there's this, there's this intense demand for people who are willing to put in the work to get the value that they were promised with agile development, and this hundreds, thousands of very experienced practitioners who are able to explain, okay, you wanna do the work, here's the work that you need to do. And so um, it, it was, it's, it's all fragmentary at the moment. And I think uh, a big project for myself for the rest of, of or for the, this coming year, is seeing how best to bring that desire for the hard work of improvement together with the people who really know how to do that. I wanna do that in a way that's less, uh, less personal than it was last time around. Um, more of a producer, um, but uh, bringing those, those groups of people together and seeing what can happen. Because the fundamental promise of software development remains unfulfilled. Like the, we have this technology that scales like nothing in human history, and we're not using it nearly as effectively as we could. And that still pisses me off. So that's what I would like to see happen. Oh, we look forward to seeing that. Um, just to switch topics a bit, um, you've been doing some experiments with uh, you know, working with, you know, trying to see what, what techniques might work with very large numbers of programmers. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about those? Sure. T towards the end of my time at Facebook, I'd seen Facebook grow from 700 engineers to, to 5,000 engineers. And there, was, there were plenty of people thinking, how do you get from 5,000 to 10,000? So thought, that's not an interesting question. What would it take for 100,000 engineers to collaborate on the same system at the same time? And one of the universally recognized fundamental truths of development in this code review pull request style is that smaller pull requests are better. So I thought, OK, we'll just. Some, I don't have very many tricks, Dave. So I'm just gonna turn the crank on small diffs, absolute to the maximum, and see what happens. And so the, the name of the project is Limbo, because the Limbo song asks, how low can you go? How small could we make diffs? And if we made diffs so small and so safe that you didn't require pre-commit code review, then you could have many more people working with uh, on the same system with far fewer merge conflicts. And uh, I've started like concrete experiments and it's clearly impractical to have you edit a comment and have that pushed out to production on thousands of machines and millions of smartphones. But if it was practical, somebody would already be doing it so then it wouldn't be interesting anymore. So that's the idea. 
Um, and I don't know where that's going to go or how to push it forward. But well, I mean, I, I think you know, both our shared experience working with small talk and our certainly our environment with, with the the I mean, developer environment was that basically the people were sharing very fine-grained changes to the image, and in fact, you know, you, you essentially you didn't merge because you were always merged, right? Yes. In a sense, so you you didn't, and the pieces were far enough apart, even though there were lots of changes, that the number of times you actually got a conflict was really low. I right. Mean, I mean, yeah. Right, and, and that's the question. If you if you crank that change size down far enough, and and your environment knows what you're doing. So you're not just editing random text. You're like, I'm deleting a comment. Well, OK, that's safe. Push that out everywhere. Why not? I had an interesting uh, talk this week from a fellow at the, her CTO conference in Sydney, and uh, basically found he basically they're blocked by merge conflicts. Right? Particularly, actually, a Twitter, a former Twitter, but basically if in, his, in his new company, and basically, especially they were distributed because, you know, you used to have to wait for someone at Google to approve, then someone at Twitter to approve and find someone to, and so basically what he's gone to is, uh, is basically the review is after, so the change goes ahead, and then they review them after, and that way people can batch them up and just do the reviews like the next morning or later that week. And they, their experience so far is they don't, they're not blocked, mm -hmm. so they're getting a lot more done and people are not sort of being interrupted, hey, I need this code reviewed or blessed or whatever it is. Right. So they're, they're noticing that they're, they're really getting more velocity and not, they're not having a problem with you know, bad code going in. Yeah. Right, I think the, that code review style creates a lot of value, but it also creates enormous costs. And all those costs of having to multitask or stack diffs up or kind of artificially change the, your development style, none of that's accounted for any place. There's, there's no way of figuring out, okay, and the company is spending 40% of the engineering budget on code review or 80% or 10%, like you just, you can't tell. And so the, it's a, definitely an experiment to try this much smaller style with uh, post hoc uh, change reviews, but uh, it's worth doing because the, the potential upside of it is large and scales up. The bigger the organization gets, the higher the cost of code review get, and the, the higher the, the cost in time, the higher cost in social friction, you know, this, hey, why didn't you, uh, you know, review my diff? Well, I have a job too. Uh, you know, that just gets worse and worse the more people are there. So that means the greater and greater the benefits as the team scales up, which is, that's where you want to be. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. With, uh, but uh, great to have you here, Kent. Really appreciate you coming to Australia. And, Thank you. Uh, it's been my the, pleasure. The uh, audiences here have enjoyed uh, hearing you and talking to you, and we look forward to seeing your work on 3X and Limbo. All right, thanks, thanks very much. All right, bye-bye.